Let me ask you to take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, and you can put a marker in chapter 2 because we will be there in a moment as well. As most of you know, we stepped aside from our Genesis series over the past couple of Sundays so that we could really focus in on our Lord's Passion Week. I have to say that Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday were were really special and blessed days for us. Uh, It was a a wonderful thing to gather and to uh, focus on Christ and to uh, rejoice in the gospel. I would say if you missed one of those services, you were missed here, and I would also encourage you, uh, if you missed the teaching, to go back and get caught up on those things. All of that's now online, and uh, I think we, we covered some ground that would be important for you to uh, go back and review, and so if you, if you haven't uh, been a part of those services and haven't yet done so, I'd encourage you to go back and catch up on what we did in that last week. This morning, though, we're returning to the book of Genesis let me just say, I, I'm glad to get back to our rhythm of exposition. I, I, I love to study like this. You know that. I've said here many times that there is something very good and healthy about studying what God said, how He said it, and in the order He gave it. This is why we work through books of the Bible and see the context of the flow of arguments. We want to know why God said what He said, when He said it, to whom He said it, and what it means for us. Uh, Let me just say, if you are ever asked the question, what does this, pointing at the Scriptures, mean to you, uh, avoid that question. Because the question is not, what does this mean to you? The question is, what does this mean? And this, what we're striving to study is, what does this mean? Regardless of time, regardless of situation, what does the Word say and what does it mean you know, in the three weeks prior to Passion Week, we, we wrestled with the record of God's special creation of man. And I want to take just a minute to remind us kind of where we were, because we've stepped aside for a couple of Sundays. I want, to, I want to get us back kind of in the groove of this study. And I think it's important for us to remember the fact that the creation of human life was the crowning point of the creation record. We talked about that as we looked at Genesis chapter number 1. In fact, the text tells us that mankind alone was made in the image of God. In the image of God. And we said that there is both a representative and a functional part to the meaning of the image of God in man. We've talked about that. We represent Him in the world. We function as caretakers of His creation. The Scriptures are also clear, though, that in spite of the fact that man would rebel and sin against God, God stopped and He stooped and He formed man from the dust and He breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. God showed His goodness and His kindness throughout the creation story. And instead of simply making man and putting him in some kind of a hostile, inhospitable environment, God provided for him. God provided more food than he could ever eat, more beauty than they could ever possibly enjoy, more wealth than they could ever possibly spend. All of it's right there in the text. You see it as you study this this chapter 1 and chapter 2 as we look at God's creation of man. His goodness to man is in every part of the story. God is good. Well, friends, part of that goodness to man is not usually seen as goodness. You see, God commanded the man And God set the boundaries for mankind within His created order. Most of us don't like authority. Just naturally we buck it. We we, we resist it. And yet authority is something we must reckon with. That command from God was a statement of both provision and prohibition. We saw that in Genesis 2, verse 16. We saw the Lord God commanded the man saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden. He's pointing out this bounty and His provision. Look at this garden I planted for you. This is your home. Eat your fill. But there's a prohibition as well because He said in verse 17, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. So there's a whole garden at your disposal. There's one tree you may not eat. 
Not only was there a provision and was there a prohibition, but there was also a consequence stated. Because again in verse 17 we read this, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. There is consequence for not submitting to the authority of the Creator. There always has been. There always will be. And I think it's important for us to understand, friends, that all that we studied over the previous three weeks established twin truths for us we need to keep before us. Two truths, twin truths. First of all, it's this, God is the creator of man. God is the creator of man, and as the creator, God is also the commander of man. We have to keep these in mind. This is how the scriptures begin It is how the Scriptures end. This is the message of the Word. God created and God commanded. And friends, those twin truths prove vitally important throughout the Scriptures, but they will prove especially so and foundational for what we're going to study today. What we're going to see over the next couple of weeks, Lord willing. By way of introduction this morning, let me just ask you a few questions. Friends, have you noticed that the world seems to have gone crazy of late? And the world is losing its mind. Professor and author, cultural commentator Carl Truman has astutely and carefully described this drastic culture shift from sanity to to insanity like this. He wrote the sentence, I am a woman trapped in a man's body, would have been nonsense to my grandfather. Had it been uttered by a patient to a doctor in the mid-20th century, the doctor would almost certainly have responded that the patient had a psychiatric problem and that his mind needed to be treated so as to bring its feelings into line with his physical body. Today... The doctor is more likely to respond that the problem is such that the patient's body needs to be brought into alignment with those inner feelings. Indeed, were a doctor to respond in the earlier fashion today, he might well find himself subject to legal action. Truman said his grandfather's generation would not have even had a context to understand such a statement 50 years ago. And today, to respond like that brings legal action against you. The world is changing fast. I mean, are you aware of the current and the increasing confusion over questions of gender and so-called gender identity? Have you come face to face yet with any of the fallout of the current sexual gender revolution and all of its questions and consequences? Like what pronouns you're allowed to use for people anymore? How, How do you even interact with people safely? Today. Let me ask this. Do do, do you understand the unmitigated militancy of this revolution? That is marching ahead. That is seeking to take over the minds and the hearts. Listen. Of the youngest children found within our society. In an article published this past Thursday, this week, this past Thursday, an article published by the Manhattan Institute, which is a a New York-based conservative-leaning think tank, we are told this, an Evanston, Illinois school district, okay, we're not talking about hyper-secularized Europe, post-Christian Europe, we're talking about north suburb of Chicago, Illinois. An Evanston, Illinois school district has adopted a radical gender curriculum that teaches 
pre-kindergarten through third grade students to celebrate the transgender flag, break the gender binary established by white colonizers, and experiment with neo-pronouns such as Z, Zer, and Tree. Pre-kindergarten through third grade. Now, I'm just going to read. You, you listen. You've, I'm not going to put it on the screen. I just want you to listen to this curriculum. In kindergarten, the lessons on gender and trans identity go deeper. In kindergarten, they go deeper. When we show whether we feel like a boy or a girl or some of each, we are expressing our gender identity. The lesson begins. Students are expected to be able to explain the importance of the rainbow flag and the trans flag and are asked to consider their own gender identity. The kindergartners read two books that affirm transgender conversations, I'm sorry, conversions, study photographs of boys in dresses, learn details about the transgender flag, and perform a rainbow dance. At the end of the lesson, the students are encouraged to adopt and share their own gender identities with the class. Kindergarten. In first grade, students learn about gender pronouns. The teachers explain that some pronouns are gender neutral. And students can adopt pronouns such as she, tree, they, he, her, him, them, z, and zer. The teacher encourages students to experiment and reminds them, whatever pronouns you pick today, you can always change. First grade. In third grade, students are told that white European colonizers impose their Western, listen, and Christian ideological framework on racial minorities and forced two-spirit people to conform to the gender binary. The teacher tells students that many people feel like they are really a boy or a girl, aren't really a boy or a girl, and that they should call people by the gender they have in their heart. Students are encouraged to break the binary. It is a myth that gender is binary, the lesson explains. Even though we are all given a sex assigned at birth, you are not given your gender. Only you can know your gender and how you feel inside. Third grade. Illinois. I don't want you to miss the charge in that class, the accusation in that class, that it is the Christian ideological framework that is the root of the problem for our rapidly and radically secularizing culture. The Christian ideological framework is the problem. They are teaching that to the children. I think one more introductory question I would ask you is this. Have you noted noted yet how all pervasive, how generally assumed the new radical enculturated dogma has become? If you work in a secular environment, you, you know it's, it's being pumped into you. you. You have to tiptoe and be careful. Why? Because at every turn, you're not sure where the cliff edge is because it keeps moving. And I want you to note, friends, that C.S. Lewis is credited with making this profoundly challenging statement. I think it's helpful as we think about these things. Lewis said, the most dangerous ideas in a society are not the ones being argued but the ones that are assumed, the presuppositions of the people are the most dangerous ideas. How do you get to the place that we all just assume this stuff? You teach it to the kids. 
And they grow up believing that this is just how it's always been. It's what we all know. It's the assumptions of a culture, and it is happening so fast that I would suggest that it's possible even parents in this room don't know how indoctrinated your own children already are in this. Because it's everywhere. It's in the schools. It's filling the entertainment. It's being pumped into their ears through the music. This is where our nation, our city is going. Fast. Friends, these assumed ideas are the ones that become the water we swim in and we don't even remember we're wet. It's the context. It's the basis for conversation. It's the basis for interaction. It becomes the norm. And in time, these kind of assumptions are the presuppositions that all within a society begin their reasoning from. So that if you say anything contrary, it is shocking and it is horrific and it sounds idiotic. Because we all know what you all are talking about can't be true. This is how you change a people. And brothers and sisters, I would argue that we are watching a radical, rabid, and increasingly rapid reversal of worldviews. And it's taking place right in front of our eyes. The problem is some of us just have our eyes shut. We refuse to see it. But it is what is happening. And what we're observing in the current culture and climate of our day is a concerted, willful, and militant attempt to throw off the created order established by the Creator God when He made all things and when He determined the div by divine right, by divine authority, the nature, the habitation, and the boundaries of His creatures, namely humanity. God determines the boundaries of what He's made. In fact, everything that we have just considered flies directly in the face of what we find written for us in the first two chapters of the Bible. And what I'd like to do over the next few minutes is work our way through our passage for this morning. I want to demonstrate to you why a Christian ideological framework, as it was quoted in that curriculum, rooted in the text of Scripture, is so antithetical to the current and the ongoing drift in the culture. Why is this such a problem for the culture? To do that, I, I just want us to consider three big ideas this morning. Three big ideas. I'm going to try to keep it simple so it can be memorable. I want us to think these things through. I want us to ground our thinking. And the first thing I want you to see this morning is simply this. I want you to see God's design. God's design. So we've already noted the gender binary is under attack. And that language may not be familiar to all of us. I think to many of us it will be. For those who may not be all that familiar with this language, the gender binary is the belief that there are only two genders, man and woman, male and female, okay? It's this belief, binary, only two. But if you wonder how rampant and how fast spreading and how indoctrinating this change of thinking is, let me just demonstrate to you from, uh, of all places, you know, this is now sadly the you know, authority for all things health related in our world, but the World Health Organization website, which is looked to as almost having godlike authority in much of the world, 
has this page active right now. You can go find the page yourself. Now, I'm going I'm to show you excerpts of two paragraphs. This page has over 10 paragraphs of this stuff. It just, it just goes on and on and on. But I want you to hear the new definitions for terms. I want you to understand why this is so troubling and why it's so confusing to so many people. World Health Organization website currently says this, gender refers to the characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys that are socially constructed. This includes norms, behaviors, and roles associated with being a woman, man, girl, or boy, as well as relationships with each other. As a social, social construct, gender varies from society to society and can change over time. Gender is, is sociological, they say. It's a social construct. Gender interacts with, but is different from sex, which refers to the different biological and psychological characteristics, or physiological, I'm sorry, physiological characteristics of females, males, and intersex persons, such as chromosomes, hormones, and reproductive organs. Okay, so gender is sociological, sex is physiological. Gender and sex are related to, but, but different from gender identity. Gender identity refers to a person's deeply felt, internal, and individual experience of gender, which may or may not correspond to the person's physiolog- physiology or designated sex at birth. Confused yet? In short, those who oppose the historic biblical position argue that one's sex, which they say is assigned at birth, has to do with biology and physiology. Gender, according to them, has to do with social constructs or sociology. Gender identity has to do with psychology, self-identity. And don't miss the way that the Christian ideological framework is being pushed back against at each one of these levels. But all three of them, they're pushing back against a Christian ideology. In fact, those who are actively and intentionally seeking to, and the language was, they're teaching children to break the gender binary. Break it. They argue that there are potentially an unlimited number of genders. An unlimited number of genders. In fact, I looked at two articles this week. I wish I hadn't, but I read two articles this week in research. The first one proposed 12 theoretical genders, 12 genders, and I thought, man, this is crazy, and then I turned to the next article, which actually suggested 72 genders, all named and defined, and the last one was omnigender, which means all of the above. Confused yet? And friends, I, I, I want you to hold all of this we've just talked about firmly in your thinking as we turn to Scripture. And I just want to read the text. In fact, we're going to start with one verse. Listen carefully to the unmistakably plain language, dare I say, binary language of Scripture. Genesis 1, verse number 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Don't miss this, friends. Our belief concerning human sex and gender, really the whole Christian ideological framework is rooted right here in the creation record. If we get this wrong, we'll get most things wrong. The text is telling us that God, the Creator God, is the author of humanity. And as the author of humanity, he planned it, he designed it, he formed it, he gave it life, he determined its boundaries, he established the means of its flourishing, and he has all authority over it. This is what our text is telling us. 
Even more than this, the passage tells us that God made man in his own image. Man reflects God. In other words, mankind stands as God's reflector, his his representative in the world. And friends, the text tells us plainly that God, who made man by his own design to represent him in this world, made man male and female, period. This is God's design. His divine design for humanity. Now I can already hear the but what abouts, right? Because there's always the but what abouts. Okay, so, so let's, let's go there. We must not deny the effects of the fall on the creation. That things are wearing down and being broken. We must not deny that there are exceptions to this binary, physiological binary in the fallen, sin-cursed world. But the language used in the World Health Organization article was the intersex person. And while thinking Christians certainly leave room for there to be physiological abnormalities and deformations of the body, the church has historically maintained that such abnormalities are a result of sin. Not necessarily the sin of the individual, but sin, sin's effect in the world, in the creation. And friends, these abnormalities do not define mankind as a whole, but are an exception to the rule of God. They don't represent his initial creation of man, which was very good. And they don't represent his ongoing design for humanity at large. In fact, the relatively rare exception, and I'll talk about what rare means in a minute, but the relatively rare exception that that they want to put front and center as if somehow this is a major part of the world population is not by any means so. But this rare exception due to some kind of abnormality or deformity must not be made to define the rule for how all of humanity thinks and lives. In fact, truth be told, conservative estimates place the number of people born with such abnormalities to be somewhere between, listen, 0.018% and 0.05% of the world's population. There's one proposed theory that has tried to expand that number out to 1.7%, but thinking doctors who know the data say that's not even close to true. That on the high end, it's probably 0.05% of the world's population actually have these kind of physical abnormalities. Friends, can I say this to you very plainly? Humanity's root problem is not confusion about gender. That's not the root problem. Humanity's root problem is rebellion against authority. Rebellion against authority. Namely, the authority of the maker, the designer of the creature. Put plainly, God made male and female, but fallen human beings want to define themselves however they please. You see, friends, the question of identity, that's a word we hear a lot. We're hopefully going to come back to it some this summer and talk more about it as a church. But the question of identity is actually a question of who gets to define you. Who gets to define you? Who gets to define me? In other words, does your maker define you? Or do you get to define yourself? Put differently, it ultimately comes down to this. Do your feelings define you? Or does God's word get the final say? This is what's going on when we wrestle with questions of identity. Who gets to define me? Who gets to define the terms? And as we talk about this, friends, can't you just hear the words of the prophet Isaiah ringing in your ears as we ask these questions? Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Think what you want, say what you want, do what you want, be what you want. 
You define you. I define me. God doesn't get a say. Friends, there's more to all of this than merely the initial design we saw in Genesis 1 and verse 27. His purpose for what he made. I want to consider another big idea. We said, first of all, consider God's design. Secondly, this morning, consider man's lack. Consider man's lack. You see, God's design for his creatures is absolutely clear from the statements we read in Genesis 1. That was, that was plain. But God has more to say about all this in chapter 2, and what we read here really is quite striking, because we come to Genesis 2 and verse 18, that's the next verse in the flow of what we've been studying, and here's what we read, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone, I will make him a helper fit for him. I want you to pause right here for a moment and understand that this is a change in the linguistic pattern of, the, of, of what we've been studying. In fact, the last chapter was so plain about it. Don't forget the way that chapter 1, all the way through it, just said the same thing again and again and again. Chapter 1, verse 4, God saw that the light was good. Chapter 1, verse 10, and God saw that it was good. Verse 12, and God saw that it was good. Verse 18, and God saw that it was good. Verse 21, and God saw that it was good. Verse 25, and God God saw that it was good. Verse 31, and God saw everything that he made, and behold, it was very good. And then we come to verse 18 of chapter 2 and read, then the Lord said, it is not good. And I would argue that the reversal of this language pattern is found here because the author intends to catch us up short and to make us say, wait a second, it's all been good, it's all been good, it's all been good. What is not good? That we would pay attention and give a little more attention to it than we might otherwise. And in verse 18, he tells us what isn't good. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Let's not forget that God made man in his own image and God has never been alone. So what do you mean? Well, even the pronouns that he used in the verses that introduced the creation of man made this plain. We saw it in verse 26 of chapter 1. Then God said, let me, right? No, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God has always dwelt in community. And God made man to live in community like he does. And God made most of his creatures to live in the closest community of marriage. Now, as you can well see, this is not a sermon on the subject of singleness. It's a sermon on God's design for the most of humanity, but I would say that we need to understand that this sermon really leads into, into further discussion of marriage and sexuality. We'll come to that, Lord willing, next Sunday. But in light of the statement I just made, and in light of the fact that so many who gather with us regularly are currently single, I think it's important for me to acknowledge the fact that God does in fact, gift some people with singleness. And as you study that subject of singleness and those who God may gift with singleness, He does so when He gifts them with this so that they might give themselves undistractedly to His service. The, the, the goal is that He would be glorified. He would be honored, right? And let me just say that my experience over the years has been that there are far too many followers of Jesus Christ who are distracted from their service of Him because they long to have a different relational status than they currently do. Singles who wish they were married, sadly, some who are married and wish they weren't. And rather than serving God where they are, as they are, they're distracted because they're constantly thinking about wishing they had a different relational status than they do. Could I just submit to you this, friends? We need to be about the service of our Lord wherever and however He currently has us. So what do we find here? God made man to live in, in community. And God determined to provide what man lacked on his own. And watch what we find next in the text. Again in verse 18, what do we say? Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. A helper fit for him. I want you to notice that this was not just about meeting a felt need in, in man. 
I feel lonely. That's, that's not what the text says. Adam didn't say, I feel lonely. God said it's not good for man to be alone. This is not just meeting a felt need in man. This was not about his loneliness. This was not just about companionship. I mean, get, get a good old man's best friend for companionship if that's what you need. It's not just about not feeling alone. I want you to remember that God had given this man a mandate. Remember the dominion mandate? Previous chapter, chapter 2. 1 verses 27 and 28, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Friends, can we just be honest for a moment about biology and physiology? Man was incapable of fulfilling this mandate on his own. He couldn't do it. He needed, here's the language of the text, a helper to accomplish this God-given responsibility in the world. And not just any helper would do, right? He needed a helper fit for him. That when the two of them came together, it actually did a God-given purpose. We don't just get to mess with that. And I want you to notice that on top of this, God was not just dictating this to man. God determined to help Adam come to the conclusion of his own need as well. Like he wanted him to come to that conclusion. And so what did God do? He let nature serve as Adam's teacher. And look at verse 19. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. Okay, God had made the animals and he brought them to the man and man is now observing the animals. He's observing the creatures, he's observing the livestock, he's observing the birds, and he's noticing some patterns as he sees these animals. And in verse 20 it says, The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But notice the conclusion, but for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. He looked at the beasts and there was no corresponding match. There was no solution to his problem. There was no answer to this dilemma He lacked a helper fit for him. You see, God wanted Adam to discover what he lacked by looking around at the created order. And he caused the animals to pass before Adam and he tasked Adam with naming the animals and Adam did so. But as he did so, he noticed that all the animals of the field and the birds of the air had mates that were a fit for them. But as the text tells us, there was not found a helper fit for him. Clearly, our passage is putting man's lack on display. And friends, I would suggest that God is proving an unmistakable and incontrovertible point here. And I would say it to you like this, that man was made by God with a personal responsibility that is far bigger than his personal feelings. Everything in our day is about feelings. What do you feel? How do you feel about that? Do you feel like a boy? Do you feel like a girl? Do you feel like a man? Do you feel like a woman on the inside? There is a God-given responsibility A creator-given responsibility given to the creature that surpasses personal feelings. And I wonder, friends, if you or I, we might not be giving the ground that many in our culture are to our feelings, but I would suggest that many of us live this last week based on our feelings, not based on what is true. We did what we felt. We ate when we felt like it. We bought what we felt like buying. We said what we felt 
like saying. May I say to all of us that we have been made with personal responsibility that supersedes personal feelings? And not only that, friends, but more than that, accompanying his God-given responsibility, man has a need that only a certain and specifically designed kind of helper can truly meet. This is what he's saying as he shows us this illustration of Adam. And I want you to watch how God met that need for Adam. And it really leads to this third and final point for us this morning. We said, first of all, note God's design. And secondly, I want you to see man's lack. But the third thing I want you to see is mankind's fit. Mankind's fit. As you certainly noticed as we worked through the the, the previous point, twice in those three verses we just read, we found a key word repeated, right? It was in verse 18 and in verse 20. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And then in verse 20, the man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. Friends, the word fit means corresponding to. It means suitable or suited to. And I want you to follow this. While the language here certainly points to the the physical and sexual correspondence of the two bodies, this was about so much more than mere utility. So you've already noted humanity has been given a purpose here on earth. By the plan and design of God, we've been given this purpose. And friends, the fit of the man and the woman was not just about their individual correspondence to or suitability to one another. It also had to do with their fit together within the plan and the purpose of God for them. Purpose gives meaning. The fact of the matter is if this is simply about, as our hypersexualized culture wants us to believe, two consenting people can do whatever they want with their bodies. It's utility. It's utilitarian. It completely dismisses the purpose for which God made them. Think about it. Just because I can take off my shoe and use it like a hammer... I can pick up my lawnmower and use it like a hedge trimmer. Does not mean that either of them were made for those uses or that doing so is a good idea. And yet there are plenty of people who say, if it works, it's all right. We're fine. The purpose for it doesn't matter. We figured out our own way. Leave us alone. Friends, understand something. When human beings divorce physical pleasures and personal feelings from God-given purpose, they will eventually go wrong every time. And human beings do this all the time. And I would suggest that human beings do this all the time and not just outside the church. Divorce personal feelings and physical pleasures from God-given purpose. We just do what we want as long as we're happy. It's okay. I want you to look with me the last three verses of our text for this morning. Verses 21 to 23. I want you to, to see what God does to solve Adam's Lack, it tells us here, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, in order to supply Adam's need, God performed the first surgery including anesthesia. Claire Joyner. (laughs) Claire and I were talking about this last week. This is what she does as an anesthesiologist. He put him to sleep and opened up his flesh, took a rib, 
And in that surgery, God took the rib, and what did he do? He made from that rib a woman and brought her to the man. I want you to notice the language, how it echoes here, the language of the previous verses. Because we saw in verse 19 a pattern, right? Out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Verse 22, we read this. Now the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman. He didn't just form him from the earth. He made her from the man. And what? He brought her. Her to the man. Same language. Verse 19, verse 22. And watch what Adam did when God brought the woman to him. Verse 23. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called. He named her too. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Clearly, Adam sees the connection. God's brought all the animals before me, and none of them are a fit, and now he brings her, and she is a fit for me. This is God's answer. This is God's design. And Adam was smitten at first sight. He was overwhelmed with the goodness and the grace of God and supplying a completer for him. In fact, his language gushes with the love that he had for her as soon as he saw her. There are those who read something demeaning into the biblical language that describes the woman as a helper fit for him, as if somehow this demeans the woman. Friends, nothing could be further from the truth. Instead, we should understand the fact that the man and the woman were made by God to correspond to one another within the purpose He had for them. He, and they corresponded physically, and they corresponded socially, they corresponded spiritually. This was a correspondence at all levels. I think it reads a little bit much into the, into the explanation of the rib, but Matthew Henry has written a comment on this that I think is beautiful, and it's worth repeating. Matthew Henry describes that God's taking the rib and making the woman this way, not made out of his head to top him, not made out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. You hear the words of Adam, bone up my bones, flesh of my flesh, she is who God made for me. Friends, I want you to understand that the Bible is clear about the fact that the gender binary was God's design and purpose for His creatures from the beginning. In fact, the complementary correspondence of the man and the woman is the very fabric of the society God intends to form within humanity. I want you to listen again to the way God describes this occasion just a few chapters later Genesis 5 we're about to come to the genealogy following Adam's life and here's what we read there this is the book of the generation of Adam when God created man he made him in the likeness of God male and female he created them and he blessed them and he named them man when they were created This is God's purpose. This is God's design. Now, friends, we have certainly not covered all the ground that we could with this. We covered a lot of ground, and I've tried to talk fast and cover as much as I possibly could in this time. But by no means have we addressed every issue or answered every question on these matters. We will come back to these things in the future. My hope is to build upon what we've considered today. In fact, next week, Lord willing, we're going to come back and consider a foundation for biblical marriage and human sexuality. It's found in the next two verses of our text. But I want you to understand that today, my goal has simply been to lay a biblical foundation from the text of Scripture 
I want to lay this foundation under our feet. I want us to help, to help us stand in these days on the truth of the word when the culture is changing faster than most of, most of us can even attempt to keep up with. But friends, can I remind you of this? Get done with today, and some of you may say, I didn't know any of this. Well, good. I'm glad you've been able to live, and it's not encroached on your life yet, but it is coming, and it's coming fast. Could I say this to all of us, friends? Your job is not to keep up with the changing culture. It's not your job. Your job is to plant your feet firmly on the truth of God's Word and not move from there, regardless of what the world may say to you or about you. Your job and mine is to plant your feet firmly on the Word of God and not budge from that solid ground. And you will be given every opportunity in the coming days to run from this truth. To abdicate it, to surrender. The question for us is, will we stand and speak? What is true when everything around us is changing? By God's grace, then, may we come to know the truth and to stand firmly upon it, come what may. And to that end, I want to pray as we close this time this morning. Father, You have been so kind, so gracious to speak with such clarity on the foundations of our understanding of the created order you've made. Father, while we haven't had time this morning to chase the the patterns of Scripture, the prohibitions in Scripture that reinforce everything we've just considered. We know that the Word is filled with this truth. And Father, we pray that You might ground us firmly on the truth. Father, may we speak boldly, but speak lovingly graciously, but confidently what you have said. May we unapologetically stand for the truth in times when it seems like error is the doctrine of the day. So, Father, I pray for each of us that you would cause us to stand with feet firmly planted and unmoved from your word. I pray that you would cause us to speak in ways that reflect you honestly and well. And that, Father, we would call one another as we call even the lost as well to submit ourselves to the truth of your word. And, Father, we will thank you in advance for what you do as you work in our hearts, as you ground our souls with the truth, and as you embolden us to move forward from here. For it's in Christ's name that we pray these things.